Good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you this afternoon on behalf of the Humanities Forum and the college. Uh, and it's my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Vorenberg of Brown University's History Department. Um, those of us who have been reading Abraham Lincoln together every Friday this semester are particularly happy to welcome him to the Humanities Forum for the value of his scholarship in this field has been widely recognized. Um, those of us in the Lincoln Reading Group have already had the pleasure of hearing him speak more informally about Lincoln over lunch today, and we look forward to his return to campus next Friday for a screening of the 2020, of the 2012 film, Lincoln. Um, Professor Vorenberg teaches courses on American legal history and the Civil War and Reconstruction. He speaks widely on such topics as constitutional history, Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, and emancipation. He was a member of Brown's steering committee on slavery and justice from 2004 to 2007, and he has received the university's McLaughlin Prize for teaching and the Romer Prize for advising. More recently, he was awarded the Billington Visiting Professorship in U.S. History at Occidental College in L.A. He decided after one year that he really missed, though, the Rhode Island winters, so he's back at Brown this year. Um, Professor Vorenberg's first book, Final Freedom, The Civil War, The Abolition of Slavery, and the 13th Amendment, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2001. It was a finalist for the Lincoln Prize and was used liberally for Steven Spielberg's film, Lincoln, the film we'll see next week. He is also the author of the Emancipation Proclamation, A Brief History with Documents, and currently is at work on two books. The first about the ending of the Civil War, and it's a book already under contract with Alfred Knopf, and another one on the impact of the Civil War on American citizenship. He has published numerous essays and articles on topics ranging from Lincoln's plans for the colonization of African Americans to the meaning of rights and privileges under the 14th Amendment. Um, we look forward to um, an excellent lecture this afternoon, and Professor Vorenberg has dressed for the occasion. He is wearing Abraham Lincoln socks. So please join me in welcoming him. do me much good standing behind here, but I, I really do have them on. Um, and yes, I was in LA last year uh, and did come back to Rhode Island and had some regrets about that for a only a little while. Well, it turns out that I'm still on Occidental University College's uh, alert so that, such that when an earthquake happens, everyone on staff gets a phone call. And I got such a phone call <laughs> a week ago and I was glad to be in Rhode Island. Um, anyway, I am going to talk about Lincoln and the Civil War and the end of slavery. And most of what I'm going to talk about does relate to the 13th Amendment, which is the amendment that abolishes slavery. And it's the subject of my first book, but more to your concerns, it is the central subject of the film Lincoln by Steven Spielberg, a film in which Spielberg and the screenwriter Tony Kushner set out to do a film about Lincoln, took Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Lincoln, which is mainly about Lincoln and his cabinet, wrote up a screenplay that covered much of Lincoln's life, but mostly the presidency. It was too sprawling. And so they decided to focus on one piece, and that piece was the final passage of the amendment abolishing slavery. So because you're all going to be there next week, I'm sure, uh, with friends, that I'll let the film speak for itself, although I'll be there and I can answer questions if you have specific questions about the film and how they relate to actual history. A lot of what I'm doing today is doing, in effect, the setup, because the film begins at a moment uh, 
when Congress uh, is taking up the amendment for what will be the last time because it is adopted. Uh, and then I'm going to jump past that and then ask, okay, so once the amendment is past Congress, what's the next step in terms of ratifying the amendment and then what actual impact does it have on law? Um, I'll do all that rather quickly, but then I want to step back and think a little bit more deeply about this question of when Lincoln is thinking about emancipation, whenever he's thinking about emancipation, what is he thinking about when it comes to the future of African Americans in the United States? A question that I think a lot of people are talking about. Uh, we just had an informal conversation about it. So I will uh, finish by talking about that. Uh, but let me just begin with the most overarching narrative of the story of how abolition becomes law in America. I think many of you know this story, but just to take us through um, this <clears throat> the standard narrative. And I'm gonna actually jump to the very end in a sense, um, and then take us back a little. So, <clears throat> On January 31st, 1865, the House of Representatives passes by the supermajority it needs the vote to adopt the amendment abolishing slavery, and then the amendment is sent to the states. And what happens is that the news goes out, and it's a big deal, and immediately a crowd goes to the White House to serenade the president. This happened all the time during the Civil War. It's a remarkable thing about the White House covered in security. Now, of course, you can't get closer than like half a mile. Back then, you could, with a bunch of people, just go right up and ask Lincoln to come out and say a few words. He might not do it, but often he did, and on this occasion, he did. It's the day after, so the news has gone out. And they ask Lincoln to come out and say a few words. And so he speaks uh, extemporaneously, which he also didn't do that much. Usually, he had a very carefully crafted script. And on this occasion, um, he says a number of things about uh, the Civil War, but it's very brief. And he says, this amendment, he's talking about the 13th Amendment, is a, king, a king's cure for all the evils. It winds the whole thing up. And I've always thought about that very brief statement. It winds the whole thing up. We would assume, assume that he's talking about slavery, that now it's over, right? Slavery is dead. Uh, and I think he had that in mind. But this metaphor of the king's cure. What's he talking about? And fortunately, I'm at a university right now, that is, I'm speaking at one, uh, where I suspect there's a lot of scholars who know exactly what the king's cure was. So when Lincoln uses this phrase, a king's cure, what he's referring to is a practice from medieval and early modern times in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> mostly in Western Europe, mostly in France, although also in England, uh, where it was believed that the king had divine powers such that they could lay hands on a sick person and the cure would come. Now this was most commonly practiced uh, with the disease of scrofula. And it was not, I said the king, but often it would be a queen, but often it becomes known simply as the king's cure. And Here's just an image of uh, such a practice happening, this idea of curing the scrofula, which is a disease uh, that afflicts the head and was quite common at the time. And this idea that Lincoln, when he reaches for a metaphor, thinking about the end of slavery, would go here, of all places, to a monarchy, right? And to an age of deep religion, uh, traces even of magic, one might think, is really fascinating. Uh, it's not the only time. Lincoln was very well read, <clears throat> uh, generally speaking, in history and, and religion. And this is a moment where we see that reading come through. But then we stop and think, well, what's really going on here? Does Lincoln think that he is the king, invested with some kind of divine power, and he's used that divine power to cure the nation of the evil of slavery? 
If so, that is not the humble Lincoln that we often think of, hardly. So it's an odd metaphor for him to use. And I'm not gonna tell you the truth behind it because the honest thing is we don't really know, but it's a peculiar thing. What was he thinking about? We never really know. But certainly one of the things is that after two years, more than two years, of being pressured to issue some kind of emancipation order, he has undergone tremendous internal deliberation and travail as he's been criticized for not doing this earlier or not strongly enough. And he has always been being told that if this is to happen, that is emancipation, it must come from the president. He's tried to resist. He's pushed Congress to move in this direction. Certainly the army has taken a leading role and obviously the most leading role of all has been taken by African Americans, a fact that Lincoln himself acknowledges numerous times um, in 1863 and 1864. But ultimately he knew that for the act to be considered final, it's, it had to be him. And maybe that's what's going on. To get to that moment, when he says that bit about the king's cure, you have to go back to mid-1862, if not earlier, to the moment in July of 1862 when he <coughs> reads a draft that he's written of the Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet. That's what's depicted here. This is a reproduction of a very famous painting by Francis Carpenter, who actually lived in the White House for months in order to get the painting right. This is after the Emancipation Proclamation uh, and interviewed uh, a number of people and then did the painting. This is this famous image of Lincoln with his cabinet. It is the cover of Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, famous book, Team of Rivals. It's the cover art for that. And Lincoln is, of course, center, holding the proclamation. Uh, you can't really tell, but the painting behind him Andrew Jackson, the idea is to invoke the strongest of strong executives known of the time, President Andrew Jackson, uh, and that Lincoln is effectively like Jackson, using his power as president to do something rather significant on behalf of all people and not just personal interest. So he does this reading in July of 62, and the cabinet advises him and he agrees that he should not issue the proclamation right away. That if he issues the proclamation right away, because the United States Army is not doing very well in the field, that it will be seen as an act of desperation, what his Secretary of State, William Henry Seward, calls a last shriek. And you don't want to look weak. So wait for a military victory. And Lincoln puts it in his desk drawer, and waits for a military victory. No one thought he would have to wait so long. Uh, but he was plagued with a general in George McClellan who had what Lincoln called the slows, and uh, took him a long time to come to something that we could call a victory, which happens in September of 1862 at the Battle of Antietam, or Sharpsburg if you're on the Confederate side, which was claimed as a United States victory, had the bloodiest day of the Civil War, and after which Lincoln issues the preliminary proclamation of emancipation, giving the Confederacy 100 days to lay down arms, and if they don't, then he'll sign the final proclamation. Uh, the proclamation will then go into effect. Now, while he is uh, sitting on this thing in his desk, uh, before he issues the proclamation, he's being pestered by many people to issue some kind of order of emancipation. And the leading pesterer is Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, the, one of the most widely circulated newspapers of the time. Greeley was an abolitionist and a very well-known figure, and he publishes in the pages of the New York Tribune what he calls the, pr the prayer of 20 millions, uh, demanding that Lincoln issue a proclamation. Now, the prayer of 20 million speaks to the 20 millions of people 
of African descent who have been enslaved in the United States over all the years. They pray now that an order be issued. Lincoln responds in this very famous letter to Horace Greeley, this public letter, in which, notice the date, August 22nd, so we are in between. We're in that in-between period between Lincoln having drafted the proclamation, it's in his desk, and actually issued it publicly. So he knows that the proclamation is coming when he writes this letter about his paramount object, which is to save the Union and not to free slaves. And if it means that he frees no slaves to save the Union, that he'll do. If it means freeing all the slaves, that he'll do. To free some, that he'll do. This is perhaps the most commonly cited document for those who want to say that Lincoln was a reluctant emancipator. That is, that he was willing to emancipate no slaves in order to save the Union. And maybe it's useful as a piece of evidence for that, except for the fact that he had the document in his desk that said he was going to emancipate slaves. Not all, not all. Uh, he was not going to emancipate slaves in the states of the Union where slavery existed, that is, slave states that had stayed loyal to the Union, Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, in those places, untouched by the proclamation. Nor was he going to free slaves in areas where the United States Army already had occupation and where there were loyal citizens. But in those places where there were disloyal people, Confederates, as the army came in, slaves were to be freed. That was the idea. And for this proclamation, Lincoln was roundly criticized because, remember, he has been elected on a platform that said he would not interfere with slavery where it exists. He only meant to restrict it from spreading to the West. And here he is in September issuing the proclamation uh, that does exactly what he said he would not do. And for this, he is called by some a devil. This is an anti-Lincoln image, obviously, in which Lincoln takes off his fake face and you see the devil behind. It says King Abraham before and after issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. And behind him, you'll notice the gibbet. He's ready to be hanged. We sometimes forget the incredible criticism that Lincoln came under for so many things. This is a somewhat better known uh, cartoon. Uh, by a man named Volk, who's criticizing Lincoln for writing the proclamation. Just to take you around some of the iconography of the image, Lincoln has his foot on the Bible, right? very disrespectful, sacrilegious. He's dipping his pen in an inkwell of a devilish sort, the gargoyle. There are two images behind him. On the left, is John Brown, the John Brown of Harper's Ferry. So they're equating Lincoln with John Brown, this man who terrified Virginians, uh, white Virginians and the South, and quite frankly, many in the North, for this idea of uh, starting, trying to start a slave insurrection. On the right is a painting of Toussaint, Ovatur, and the Haitian, uh, during the Haitian Revolution, something that was still very much in American memory as a way in which the Republic can go terribly wrong uh, if there is a revolt of the enslaved. Um, this was an image of the Haitian Revolution, not the reality. But that image is very important for American identity. So Lincoln is depicted as someone who's inciting slave rebellion and who's acting, and this becomes now important for the amendment, unconstitutionally. Because of all the criticism of Lincoln, the one that there was the uh, most unanimity on among people was that it was unconstitutional to free slaves. This freeing of slaves was something that was supposed to be done, if done at all, only by states, never by the nation. And so states were supposed to pass laws freeing slaves. This is how it had been done. Uh, in every state of the Union up to this point, state action of some, of some sort, a law, 
an amendment to a state constitution, a judicial opinion. Here is Lincoln doing it at the federal level. Now he does it by invoking his power as commander in chief. And so it's a wartime act. But as a wartime act, it is a significant act because clearly it is meant to last beyond the war. And we know this because the famous words in the final proclamation, forever free. Once free, forever free. Lincoln later on will be pressured by many at various moments to retract the proclamation or modify it in some way. And he refuses. He says he cannot do this. That if he would to do this, if he were to do this, that he would be judged and damned by history for all time. Why did he do it? Well, he says it. He wanted to save the Union and he wanted to win the war. Also, there is a military consideration. Oops. Attached to the proclamation is a clause saying that freed people, along with those who are African Americans who are already free, will be welcomed into the military service as combatants. Up to this point, they've been hired by the Army and Navy as laborers. <coughs> as laborers. Now they can serve in uniform, and that will begin immediately. This, again, is criticized by many. And you see it here as the idea that Lincoln's simply doing this as a way to win the war. This is a racialized image. He's playing right, cards with Jefferson Davis, and he's playing what is to be uh, the ace of spades, which is the invocation of a pejorative term for black people at the time. But notice the table that they're playing on, a table of gunpowder, that this was the fear that emancipation and then arming African Americans would lead to another Haitian revolution, a slave insurrection, uh, a Nat Turner of grand scale with armed African Americans. Of course, none of this happens. Lincoln really never worried about it happening, but his critics did. The stakes for him then were very high. He had to deal with those who were worried about this. And then comes the proclamation on January 1st, 1863. It is this much treasured document. <clears throat> You go to the National Archives exhibit, they have, of course, the Declaration of Independence. They have the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. But there it is, the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's treasured as one of these documents of freedom. And that's 1863. And the next thing we know when we read our textbook, suddenly, boom, obviously, comes the next thing, which is the 13th Amendment which, as we read about it, simply takes the proclamation and makes it into a constitutional amendment. This is the standard narrative, and it's incorrect and incomplete. But that's how it's often told, that the 13th Amendment is a kind of an afterthought, a constitutionalization of something that's already been done. You see before you the words of the amendment. I can come back to these words if you want uh, during the question period. They, there are two clauses, uh, and it seems rather short, but like so many parts of the Constitution, each word is loaded with meaning. The words themselves are taken from the Northwest Ordinance directly. That's a law passed in 1787, and included measures to prohibit the expansion of slavery into what was then called the Northwest. It's what we would call the Upper Midwest, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Michigan, and Illinois, and Indiana. As these places are to be settled, there is not to be slavery there. Anti-slavery lawyers, lawyers generally, knew the language of the, third, of the, excuse me, the Northwest Ordinance back and forth. This is the language they use for the amendment. It includes a clause, which I may as well point out now, and I hope there might be a question about it later, that says, that there is an exception to abolition, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, suggesting, if you read it literally, that enslavement can still exist as a punishment for a crime. 
And for those of you who have seen the documentary 13, or have read the work of Michelle Alexander, who's heavily featured in that documentary, you'll know about this clause because it's the reason why the documentary is called 13, because it's a reference to the 13th Amendment. This clause, the exception clause, now gets perhaps even more attention than the abolition message of the overall thing because of the fact of mass incarceration today and especially racialized incarceration today. The second clause seems very sort of mindless and legalistic, simply saying Congress will enforce it by appropriate legislation. What does that mean, appropriate? They, they actually didn't argue that much about it, but I'll tell you, after the amendment gets adopted, there's a lot of argument about what exactly is appropriate legislation to enact the end of slavery, and we are still arguing about that today. And so the 13th Amendment becomes this sort of afterthought until 2012 when Steven Spielberg produces this film that takes a moment in history, the adoption of the 13th Amendment, here depicted in Harper's Weekly above, and turns it into a drama. Uh, that involves Lincoln, but also involves Congress. It's you know, whatever else you think about the film, it's a remarkable achievement, or at least a remarkable undertaking, to try to create a riveting drama about Congress. Uh, that is not something I think people are necessarily going to be doing in the future. But it is left to Congress to adopt the amendment. An amendment to the Constitution, remember, needs two-thirds of Congress to be adopted and three-quarters of the states for ratification. Nowhere in that process does the president have a role to play. The president doesn't sign the amendment, although Lincoln did, uh, though he didn't have to. And it is up to Congress. And so for all that the movie is about Lincoln and called Lincoln, it is, of course, about Congress. And then Lincoln gives the speech I mentioned before about the king's cure. I'll come back to that in a second. February 1865, the amendment has now been adopted, sent to the states for ratification. The Civil War is still going on. There may have, be some questions now, good questions, which I we'll deal with later about the following. I just said that two-thirds of Congress must pass and three-quarters of the states must ratify. Ah, are we going to count the states that have left the Union? So we have 11 states that have seceded. Do they get to ratify the amendment? Do they get to vote on ratification? That's an interesting issue. It turns on the question of whether they, in fact, have left the Union. They think they've left the Union. Lincoln has never accepted secession as legitimate. Those states, under Lincoln's dictum, have never left. That's why he always uses the phrase so-called secessionist states. And so this is one of the issues about who gets to Take part. All right, now that's the setup for the following. Lincoln, during the Civil War, is involved in trying to take the governments of these states that have seceded, but he doesn't say they've seceded, and to convert them into loyal governments. So this is his vision. That is, you have, it's not that the states have left, they've just been hijacked by traitors. Now the goal is to get them, the governments, back in control of loyal people. And then, that's it. The union is reestablished. If you go with that philosophy, then states should take part in ratification. He was opposed on this by members of his own party. 
including Charles Sumner, the famous senator from Massachusetts, and a number of others, most of them abolitionists, who said that when a state declared that it had left the Union, it had committed a form of what Sumner called state suicide. It had basically stopped being a state. And it was up to the federal government to do what it wanted to in order to get that state back into the Union, to dictate what terms to bring that state back to the Union. So Lincoln gives an address in April dealing with the subject of how are these states to come back into the Union. The reason for this address is that there has been a major surrender on April 9, 1865. Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, has surrendered to Ulysses Grant, the leading U.S. general. This happened at Appomattox Courthouse. That's April 9th. Lincoln, I didn't give the date, I left it out, but this is April 11th. Uh, a couple days later, will give an address that is his last public address. Now, I should probably remind you that Lincoln didn't know it was going to be his last public address. Uh, in three days, he will be assassinated. I should have said spoiler alert, I guess. Um, and so this turns out to be his last public address. And um, he says that Richmond has fallen, Petersburg has fallen, this, and we have, um, when he calls the surrender of the principal insurgent army. Notice, he doesn't say the end of the war. He doesn't say that peace has come. He says there is hope, it gives us hope, of a righteous and speedy peace, which is the title of my talk today, A Righteous Peace. That, I must confess, is the title because I am thinking a lot these days about the end of the Civil War. I was, uh, this is the book I'm working on now. How do you end a war? But how do you end a war when the subject is emancipation? If you have said that emancipation is now an aim of the war, that you're fighting a war not just for union but for emancipation, and certainly that's what the proclamation does, among other things then can you really say that the war is over if slavery still exists in some way? That's not just sort of a hypothetical. That's a very real question that was facing Lincoln and Congress. And one of the reasons, and there are others, why Lincoln does not say peace is arrived, but rather there is hope of a righteous peace, meaning a peace that is just, and he has in mind just to the former Confederates, but I would argue especially to former slaves who are now free. And in this, he addresses what's going on in Louisiana, one of these states that's undergoing reconstruction, and he says, look, Louisiana has voted to ratify the 13th Amendment. We should accept that vote of ratification. And basically, that's what the Union does over the next few months is they accept the votes of the formerly seceded states, I'll, call, I'll treat it as legitimate secession, as, uh, as legitimate, as basically they count them. So the state that puts the amendment over the top and gets it adopted is Georgia. When Georgia ratifies, there are still states in the north that have not ratified. You'll be happy to know that Rhode Island claims to be the first state to ratify the 13th Amendment. It isn't, but it claims to be. Uh, <laughs> Illinois is really the first, but it really depends on how you count it, as with so many things. So that is the uh, overall story of the amendment getting uh, up until Lincoln's death. And I've left out the machinations, the fascinating back and forth about the amendment's actual passage through Congress because that is detailed so well in the film. Lincoln dies. What happens to the amendment afterwards? It is finally ratified in December of 1865, many months after Lincoln has died. 
and has been succeeded by his vice president, Andrew Johnson. And then Congress convenes in December of 1865. The terrain of Reconstruction uh, is now clearer than it was before. It is clear that the southern states, those states that are trying to get back in the Union, are interested in doing what they can to uh, halt the process of emancipation or maintain some kind of control. And so Congress, dominated by Republicans, passes legislation um, that will enforce the amendment. I forgot to, uh, oops, right, sorry about this. Um, and so that legislation uh, is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So in this story of the amendment, Lincoln obviously plays a dominant role. This image of Lincoln as the liberator, the man who frees the slaves, is everywhere. This is the famous statue, or an image of the statue, where Lincoln is shown as freeing the slaves. The kneeling slave, the standing Lincoln, uh, calling the slave to rise. This idea that the slave cannot be free without Lincoln's intervention is the dominant image. And so when we look at the film, Lincoln has to play the central role in the passage of the amendment abolishing slavery. And the slave in this image is reduced to a kneeling slave in the film it's worth paying attention to where are African Americans in this film and what roles are they playing in terms of central roles. I want to offer a slightly different story about the 13th Amendment than the film might give, just very quickly. If you actually think about it and study the documents, you realize that there was a push for some kind of universal act of emancipation immediately after the proclamation. One of the criticisms of the proclamation by the abolitionists and by African Americans generally is that it didn't go far enough because it didn't free the slaves everywhere and it only freed the slaves someplace. It said nothing about their status, about their rights, and this was a problem. And it left ambiguous the state of many African Americans. In the middle of 1864, more than a year and a half after the proclamation has been signed, a woman in Maryland writes a letter to Abraham Lincoln. This is an African-American woman. She is enslaved in Maryland. It is August of 1864. This is the letter and I'll read it to you. Mr. President, it is my desire to be free to go to see my people on the eastern shore. My mistress won't let me. You shall please tell me if we, you shall please let me know if we are free and what I can do. I write to you for advice. Please send me word this week or as soon as possible. Annie Davis lives in Bel Air, Maryland at the moment, but her family lives on the eastern shore of Maryland and her owner, who is a white woman, has told her she can't go. We are a year and a half past the proclamation and, an and a woman who believes she's free for darn good reason because a proclamation has been signed is being told that she can't have what we might think of as the most basic right of freedom, which is the freedom to move, to go see her family. And yet her mistress is the one who is legally correct because Maryland has not abolished slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation has not touched Maryland. It was slaves and free African Americans like Annie Davis who were the ones driving for a universal act of emancipation. Lincoln did not respond to Annie Davis. I don't think he ever saw this letter. It ended up in the War Department. But he did not respond to others who asked him, who demanded, who begged him to do something beyond the proclamation after January 1st, 1863. We get to August 1864, and he still has done nothing. 
And there is a massive amount of attention on the notion that something must be done. And there's the major reason there's a massive amount of attention is that there is a petition drive going on to collect a million signatures is the goal of two leading abolitionists whose names you may recognize, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We think of them more as suffragists or feminists. But of course, they were also abolitionists, and they set out to collect, as I said, a million signatures for a universal act of emancipation. And women of the Loyal National League of Women carried this petition uh, around, or pieces of it, then they were going to tape it all together. They carried this around the country into places that were hostile territory in Missouri. And they collected these signatures you see here. Just, I, I just show you a couple of these signatures so you can see what they look like. This uh, then triggers other amendment drive, or excuse me, other petitioning drives. This is a classic petition. I could say more about this, where you segregate the gentlemen's names on one side and the ladies' names on other. That's actually what the other petition does. Um, you can't tell, but on this, you have the woman, um, undersigned woman of the United States, turn it around, and it's the men. So the idea was to collect all these uh, petitions. And that drive brings the amendment or the need for an act to Congress. Charles Sumner, who I've mentioned before, is approached by these women, asked by him to introduce this measure to Congress, and he does. This is in early 1864, and it is carried in dramatic fashion on the floor of the Senate by two African-American men who deliver this request for a measure of universal emancipation. Lincoln has said nothing about this measure, uh, for or against it. The Senate will pass this measure, not the exact measure that they had called for, but the amendment as you saw. They will pass it in April of 1864. It will then go to the House of Representatives that will fail to pass it. They don't get the two-thirds vote they need in June of 1864. Lincoln is pressured that it get on the Republican platform that he's running on for re-election in 64. He agrees, and so only then does it show up on the, on the platform, but that's all private. Lincoln still hasn't endorsed it publicly. He gets re-elected, comes back into office. Um, well, actually, he's technically not going to take his inaugural till March of 65, but in December of 64, then he starts pressing for the amendment. That's rather late in the game to be doing this. And so why is he so late to this universal act of emancipation? And now I'll just quickly run through some, uh, an answer, not the answer, because I think there is no single answer. But one of the answers is that he's still struggling about when the slaves are free, all of them, what is to happen? He's been struggling this for, with this for a long time. There are a couple alternatives, and now I'm just going to whiz you through this quickly, and then you can ask questions. One alternative that he's been thinking about for a long time, I'll just jump through here and come back if needed. Um, you may be wondering about what I just showed you. But if you ask about the uh, legislation that follows from the 13th Amendment, I'll have more to say about that, and then I'll take you back to those images and say more about the Civil Rights Act because it's hugely significant and understudied. Um, and it's actually, its meaning is being, is about to be heard by the US Supreme Court in a case this term. Lincoln has thought about colonizing African Americans abroad. This is something he has been thinking about for a long time. Colonization has been, been around in the United States as an idea since the 1700s of emancipating slaves and then sending them voluntarily, only if they want to go abroad. This is how the colony of Liberia is created. Liberia becomes an independent republic in 1847, but still the primary destination for black emigrants in the colonization movement. It is absolutely impractical and absurd. Um, in the year that the most slaves, uh, excuse me, freed people are sent to Liberia, in that year, that single year, 
we're talking about the number of people that are sent that year equals the number that are born into slavery in any given month. Uh, so there's just no way this is ever going to lead to a segregation of the races. Lincoln comes into office, he pitches the idea. First, he's thinking about the possibility of um, Central America. He brings an African-American delegation into the White House in August of 62. You can look this document up, and he pitches to them this idea of leaving the country. He tells, he asks them, why should you leave this country? You and we are of different races. We have between us a broader difference than exists between almost any other two races. This is one of the reasons he gives for why they should depart. He targets <clears throat> the colony of uh, Cherokee in Central America. And he appoints people to be his commissioners of colonization, a senator, Pomeroy, James Mitchell, his commissioner agent. This idea um, he then announces publicly in his annual address in December of 62, a month before he's set to sign the proclamation, which is the reason behind this image where a cartoonist has, is showing these African Americans who think they're about to be free now reading that in fact that they might have to go to Central America and that emancipation might be postponed, maybe till 1900, because that also was in his message. The idea that African Americans wanted to go, that at least some, is, has some grain of truth, and Lincoln believed this could happen. This is a painting that suggests the idea that this is something they wanted. This is a white painter who's painting this as we imagine he is reading, the subject is reading about colonization. On the left is a poster of Haiti. The Central America plan founders for diplomatic reasons. Among other things, if you study diplomatic history, it's a straight up violation of the Monroe Doctrine to set up a colony in Central America, violating the treaty uh, Webster, Ashburton Treaty, but don't worry about those details. Seward tells Lincoln this, Seward's Secretary of State, Lincoln says, okay, that's not gonna work. But he doesn't give up. The day before he signs the final proclamation, he signs a contract with a man who owns a small island right here off of Haiti called Ile Avache, Cal Island. And that contract is for sending labor, black labor, to this island where they will work and perhaps set up a colony. And that group of people go in 1863. Within a year, the whole thing fails. It is um, basically a swindler's idea, the white man who owns the island, Bernard Koch. And he has this whole idea of he's gonna be the president of this nation. He prints currency for this nation that's gonna be at Ilavash. Um, Lincoln, even after the failure of the Cow Island expedition, he never says anything about colonization, but labor recruiters continue to come into the United States from foreign lands asking for labor and whether they can recruit from freed people. And Lincoln actually allows them and endorses their efforts to recruit black American labor if they're willing to go to South America where labor is needed for various reasons. Is that colonization? Some historians have said it is and say that Lincoln therefore obviously still believed in colonization, but publicly Lincoln never endorses colonization after the Emancipation Proclamation. The leading reason was is, is because African Americans were doing so well in the army. By the end of the Civil War, the US Army has enlisted almost 200,000, and Navy, I should say. The armed forces have enlisted close to 200,000 African Americans. They have won key victories and shown themselves uh, heroic in a way that no one had, that many had not believed was possible. And there is no going back on emancipation once this happens. Ah, 
But what is to happen when the war is over? So the recruiting of African Americans is a well-known story. It's a story told in such films as Glory, the heroism of those in the 54th Massachusetts, for example. The transformation of people from what this photographer is trying to depict, right? The ragged slave into the heroic drummer boy. I think even more pronounced this idea of the slave now armed a painting that comes later, this idea that the slave can be armed and educated at the same time, therefore a true citizenry of the United States. The idea that when we talk about voting, it is in a former soldier that will be as active in the process as anyone else. The transformation of somebody from slave to soldier to veteran. But what really is to happen to these people after the war, to the soldier, uh, when the war is over? Do they simply go back to the citizenry as free people? To be determined, really, Lincoln hadn't thought about that because he dies before the mustering out occurs. During his life, while he's still alive, the alternative that he's thinking about more is free labor, that is people who are not in the army, but who he's going to help transform into wage laborers on the plantations in the places where they are working. This is what's going on in the sea islands of South Carolina in Georgia, as depicted in this photograph, where the Union has occupied these places since 1861. Here, Lincoln oversees efforts to not just emancipate, but more importantly, to educate these people who have been in slavery because for him, education is the key to citizenship and labor. And to be disciplined laborers, gaining wages. And when I say disciplined, I mean rule following. And the rules that the Freedmen's Bureau imports into these places are rules that are drawn from northern factories, rules that include bells that start the workday and bells that end the workday, things that had not existed on many plantations. The Freedmen's Bureau is an institution many of you have heard before. It has actually begun while Lincoln is president. Lincoln signs the bill for the Freedmen's Bureau, but even before that, you have such agencies going on. I mentioned the bells ringing, these are an example of rules, how hands, that is free labor hands, are to be governed. The education, as I said, to be crucial. And the depiction of slaves being educated becomes part of the mission of people under Lincoln who are setting out to turn the former slave into the enfranchised free African-American. Would they get the vote? Would they get other civil rights? To be determined. But absolutely, for Lincoln, education was the key. If they had any chance, because Lincoln himself had come from humble origins and he had risen. And he himself as it's had ascribed to that rising more than anything else, what he called his ambition for education. And so he demands that whatever else happens, that these people must be educated. The question of what's going to happen to the black soldiers after the war is one that Lincoln never gets to resolve. I'm just going to say a few words about this, and then I'll stop, um, because it's something I'm working on now. When the mustering out happens, Lincoln's not there to watch it happen. It's overseen by his successor, who really just gives way to other people, mostly the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. It is decided to muster out white troops before black troops. It is decided that <clears throat> white troops will be allowed to purchase their are their rifles from the army at a discount when they muster out. The army supplied them rifles. So they can buy their guns for cheap. But African-American soldiers will not have this option to buy their weapons 
for this and other reasons we see over and over again that the fear of an armed African American population is still there even among those who have endorsed emancipation, who have advocated for black people being in the army. Here is something that is very real in terms of thinking about legacies of emancipation and something that Lincoln himself most certainly would not have approved of, I believe, and evidence that when Lincoln said that this 13th Amendment was the king's cure that winds the whole thing up, that there still was quite a bit to be wound up and still to be wound up now. I'll stop there. Take any questions you have. Thank you very much for that excellent lecture. Um, Professor Vorenberg will graciously take questions. We'll do this for a little while, and I invite everyone here immediately after to a reception uh, right outside the doors. Student questions? Okay, Laura, bring this to you. Yeah, this this uh, this goes to the uh, to the amendment and its passage. And um, my understanding is that in Congress. The states that had claimed to secede did not have representatives in Congress. Is that correct? Correct. So in counting two-thirds, it would be two-thirds of the representatives from the states still in the union. Correct. An interesting and then, fudging of procedure, isn't it? Yeah. And then <laughs> with the adoption by the states, <laughs> the ratification by the states, then suddenly, suddenly the they count. southern states now count. Yeah, inconsistency. Little inconsistency. So, yeah. Yeah. So rarely do we see that in a government. Um, yeah, and this was an inconsistency that was actually brought up by critics of the amendment during the debate in Congress, precisely this, which is, um, but you see, the Republicans didn't want to address it because to address it, they had to answer the question, had those states actually left? If they'd left, then you're fine. You just count the, the legislators that are there because those are the states that are still in. But the Lincoln administration was adamant that those states had not left. So their seats are empty, waiting to be refilled, right? And so absolutely, people said, then it's not legitimate. Uh, and you could, as actually some do, say that the 13th Amendment, therefore, is not legitimate. People don't make that argument so much today, but they do focus on the 14th Amendment as illegitimate, because that's even more iffy, in that it becomes law that a state can't send their representatives back to Congress unless they ratify the 14th Amendment. That doesn't sound voluntary to me. And so, right, so, so it's, a, it's a complicated issue. We'll take another question. No waiting for students. <laughs> Student question. You answered part of my question. I was asking if they were forced to ratify the 14th and 15th Amendments before yeah. they could go back to being full states. That's correct. Yes, they had to. That was part of the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867. Uh, and so if you go on the web and uh, go searching for the text of the 14th Amendment or the 15th Amendment, sometimes you'll end up landing on a site. It's effectively a, usually a neo-Confederate site that'll say something like 14th Amendment ratified under duress. Uh, <laughs> and yet this is the most important amendment to the Constitution uh, in that it is by far, the 14th, the most cited uh, amendment in federal court procedure. It has to be because of the way that 
you have to use the 14th Amendment to get a state decision into the federal courts. Could you say something about the 1866 Civil Rights Act? And Thank you. The, <laughs> Happy to. The, the case and, and tie in the cases before the Supreme Court this term? Yeah. The case before the Supreme Court this term is not as interesting as the ones um, from way back. Let me get back there. Summer of 1865, the amendments being ratif uh, debated, ratified, is it going to be ratified or not? During this time, the southern state governments that are coming back into being pass what we call the Black Codes. They know what's coming. The 13th Amendment is coming, abolishing slavery. This is an example from a Black Code from Louisiana. What these codes do is say, okay, fine, slavery's over, but we're going to have new laws, state laws, uh, that effectively set the terms of freedom, restrict those terms, such as you have to be in the regular service of some white person or former owner who shall be held responsible for the conduct of said Negro, such as no Negro who is not in the military service shall be allowed to carry firearms. Can't carry guns if you're black. And every citizen is deputized effectively as a police officer to enforce these measures. This is happening in the summer of 65 when the war is ostensibly over. So Congress says, we need an act to deal with these things, these black codes. Ah, there's the 13th Amendment. And it has that provision that says Congress shall pass appropriate legislation to enforce this amendment. And so what they pass is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which Andrew Johnson vetoes, and then they override the veto. This language, before you look at the stuff in red, which I'll come to in a minute, if you read the earliest sentence, all persons born in the US not subject, blah, 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 hereby declared to be citizens of the US, that may sound familiar. The reason it sounds familiar is because it's the language of the 14th Amendment that would be ratified two years later. It is the language of birthright citizenship. Prior to the 1866 Civil Rights Act, citizenship was very vague. There were different opinions about it. So even if you were born in this country, it wasn't a guarantee that you were a citizen. This act makes your birth in this country a guarantee of citizenship. There are other ways to become citizens, but this is the one. And then it becomes enshrined in the 14th Amendment in the Citizenship Clause, a clause, of course, which certain politicians today would like to see gotten uh, erased. But what intrigues me in this act, which Congress never overturns, so it's still active, is the language of racial equality framed in this particular way. Not just saying that there will be equality before the law between white and black, which is the dominant language of the equal rights, but full and equal benefit full, not just equal, but full benefit, whatever that means, of all laws and proceedings for the security of personal property as is enjoyed by white citizens. It's a remarkable statement passed by the Republicans that acknowledges that there are classes of people, legally speaking, and that white citizens are the highest class. And what we now do with the law is to say, you're not equal until you have the status of a white citizen. That's the law of 1866. And so if you are treated in some way that a white citizen wouldn't be treated, then that's discrimination. I don't see how to read this any other way. That's the law in 1866. Other civil rights acts are passed and ruled unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court in the later decades. This one is not. It remains in the US code, although the full and equal benefit language has been taken out. So that's the act. And it sits fairly dormant for the reason that 
When equal rights cases come up later on, for example, the famous case of Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, separate but equal, if you read that case, you'll see that the lawyer for Plessy, Homer Plessy, who's advocating that there should be no segregation on public conveyances, on trains and streetcars, uses not just the 14th Amendment, but the 13th Amendment, and says that, look, if you keep black people from traveling on cars or streets or being in lobbies or inns or whatever, this is a badge of servitude. It's evidence of slavery, still in another form. And if you look at the 1866 Civil Rights Act, it's not the way a white person is treated or a white citizen, therefore it's unconstitutional. He makes this argument and the Supreme Court on that case and other cases says, rejects the, the 13th Amendment argument. Rejects the 14th Amendment argument too, but the 13th Amendment gets rejected. And so it sits dormant until 1968 when it gets attention on two cases. Now I've got your attention because I'm talking baseball. So Kurt Flood, who plays for the St. Louis Cardinals, is traded to the Philadelphia Phillies. It's 1968. And he says, wait a second, you can't just trade me because it's still the baseball, old baseball system before free agency. Kurt Flood likes to play in St. Louis. Philadelphia at the time has a reputation for being a very nasty place to play if you're African American. And so he says, you can't do this, and he sues. And he hires former justice, uh, Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg as his lawyer to sue on the basis of violating the 1866 Civil Rights Act and the 13th Amendment. Well, this doesn't go well for him because as he himself would say in his own autobiography, who ever heard of a slave who makes $500,000 a year? And so he loses, but in the long run, he wins because it's the Kurt Flood case that sort of opens up what will become the free agent system later on. But in the same year, 1968, is a somewhat more interesting case that will win. A couple, Joseph and Barbara Jones, who want to move into a privately managed residential area near St. Louis, are told they cannot. And it becomes very clear that the reason they're not being allowed to move into this area is because of race. This is an interracial married couple. And so they sue. And they sue not because of the 14th Amendment, because the 14th Amendment allows you to sue only if there is state-sanctioned discrimination, right? There's a state law or state action that discriminates. This is a private act of discrimination by a privately owned a housing development. They sue under the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and they win. It's a remarkable moment, and suddenly there's all this excitement in the legal community in 1968. Oh my goodness, because now we can get rid of discrimination at the private level, right? Because that hadn't been done. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made certain provisions, but it didn't go this far. Well, it turns out to be uh, a short-lived success for various reasons having to do with the federal courts that really don't buy this argument afterwards. But every now and then, every now and then, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 comes back with this kind of argument about private discrimination. All right, so the case before the Supreme Court, uh, is, now I'm gonna screw up his name, I think it's Byron Allen and his uh, company, which is African American Media. So claiming discrimination by, ooh, help me, I, I just signed the amicus brief. So uh, by one of the cable companies, and I believe it's uh, Spectrum, but I could be wrong, it's not Spectrum, it's Comcast, excuse me, Comcast. So Comcast who decides what channels to carry, what channels not to carry as a cable company, chose not to carry um, one of the channels of this company that does only African American media. And so they get sued on the basis of the Civil Rights Act of 66, that this is an act of private discrimination on the basis of race. Uh, that basically this agent, this company is allowing all these other channels into their universe that are white and that 
Obviously, it's race that's the reason they're not being carried. Now, I don't know if it's a good argument or not. I'm almost certain that this company, um, African American Media, is going to lose. Uh, it may not be a good argument, but it's interesting that they're using the language of the 13th Amendment as the basis for that suit. So that is the suit that's before the Supreme Court now. I invite everyone to the reception and thank Professor Vorenberg once again. Thank you all for, uh, for having me.